I need to embrace the phrase, good enough. What's going on, everyone? Welcome back to Road to Scale Nationals. In this series, myself, as well as Matt from the Scale Builders Guild, will be taking you through the journey as we prepare our trucks to be able to compete in class one, two, and three at Sorka Scale Nationals that'll be happening in Leesburg, Alabama at the beginning of April this year. So that is 87 days from today when this is being filmed. It's creeping up on us. A lot of work to do. Now, technically I said we were gonna be competing in three classes, one, two, and three. But in class two and three, we'll be using the same vehicle with some parts swapping that can be done between competition days. But class one is going to be our focus of today because that's where I've spent the most time. My class one truck has the furthest to go as it was a ground up scratch build. Now, for those that don't know, this truck is going to be modeled after a Jeepster Commando. Kind of. It's actually going to be kind of a mix of a Jeepster Commando and a CJ7. There was one that was built just like this that actually two separate friends of mine owned at one point. It was called the Retro Rock Rod. It was in Crawl Magazine. And like I said, a couple of my friends actually owned it at different times. And that is kind of the design that I'm going for. I like the CJ style front grills much better than the Jeepsters, but I like the kind of extra detail that the Commando has in the back and that's why I'm going to go that route. This episode could likely get long because we're getting a lot done. We're going to cover today the process that I went through on several items within this truck as it sits here. First thing we're going to cover is the fabrication of the sliders. Then we're going to talk about the vacuum forming of the internal trans cover. We're also going to talk about the design and construction of the inner support structure that I've designed that these body panels are bolting to and kind of what will start holding all of our separate body panels together to form the overall look. Then we're going to talk about some of these body panels that are already on this vehicle. And lastly, we're gonna talk about welding some titanium. Now the process that I'm going to talk about today may sound like overcomplicating, but I would argue that it made it easier and faster for me to do this one time the right way and nail it. So hang with me until the end. And it's not that difficult. It may sound fancy, but it's not that difficult. So before I did anything on these sliders, the very first thing that I did is decide what material I was going to make it out of. I went to my cabinet and I found what material I had in stock that was large enough to make these pieces out of and was close to what I thought I was after. And what I found was some 22 gauge regular mild steel. I took that sheet, I cut a piece of it off and then I mounted it into my Harbor Freight 18 inch, just dirt simple, metal break. I bent this piece to 90 degrees. This is the piece that you see here in my hand. And why I did that is that I needed to measure the radius of the bend as far as how my bender actually bent the part. That way I could take this information and then design my part off of it, matching this specific radius. And in this case with the 22 gauge steel in my bender, it had a 0 0.083 inch radius. Fusion 360 has some really easy sheet metal designs. I designed this very simple two bend slider in Fusion and I made it so that the length was the appropriate length for the body that I was going to have. As long as you're drawing it with sheet metal in mind as far as how the bends work and how features on the actual piece are going to be made, you can take, draw it in place without having to add bends or anything like that. You just draw it as you would like, and then you can convert that piece to sheet metal by simply selecting the option in the menu, convert to sheet metal, and then hit the make flat pattern button. Two clicks of the mouse, and basically it gives me a flat template of exactly what I need to make. But at that point that only lives on the computer. I could take measurements and then cut that by hand and all that, but I decided to go a step further. I took the flat pattern that Fusion exports and I made some additional geometry on there, knowing that I was going to take and make a physical sticker with this. I made these slots so they went from the start of the bend radius to the end of the bend radius. That way I would know exactly where I needed to clamp this piece of metal in my metal brake to give me exactly the output that I needed. 
All of that information is already on that template. I just needed to draw a couple of slotted areas so that I could export all of the data at one time. After I have that sketch in Fusion with the flat pattern, as well as those slotted areas that I defined, which I needed at both the outside of the rocker area, as well as near the frame rail portion, I took and I exported and saved that as a DXF file, which is just a simple 2D drawing file. From there, I needed to get it into my vinyl cutting software. I just used Adobe Illustrator, opened the DXF file and just sent it to my Cameo Silhouette 4. I got this vinyl cutter not too long ago specifically for this task, allowing me to make stencils in CAD that I could put directly on my steel or aluminum, whatever it was, to make more accurate parts. I'm using a stencil making the material. So I took and I cut two of these patterns exactly as I exported. But before I was done, I made a mirrored copy and made two more of those stencils. I took those first two stencils and put them directly on my steel. After that, I trimmed them out using a metal shear that I have here, as well as some very small metal tin snips. These tin snips are made by Bessie and they're about half the size of normal tin snips. Can't recommend them enough. I'll link to them in the description below. Once I had the pieces of steel cut out to the size of that stencil, this is when I applied the mirrored versions of the stencils to the back side of those parts. The reason that we're making these mirrored is because these sliders have opposing bends. One has to go one way, one goes the other. And since when you put it in your break, you can only see one side of the stencil, I needed them on both sides so that I could make sure I could see the start and end points of my bends, no matter which way I had it oriented. Now I've got my metal shape cut and I've got all of the information needed to create my bends on the physical part. Now I took and I mounted it into my bender, clamped it down, bent it to 90 degrees, took it out of the bender, flipped it over, put it in to do the other side, bent it again, and our sliders are almost complete. With the finished part in hand, I measured the distance from the mounting surface to where the body would sit. And I needed this to be 47.7 millimeters. And my finished metal part was just under 47 and a half. So the degree of accuracy for, you know, some basic hand tools to create that with no additional work is really good. And I designed enough just fudge room in there that getting it that close is as perfect as I could have hoped for. And I couldn't be happier because that is the first time that I've actually tried to execute that whole thought process into a finished part. And it worked exactly the same on both parts, the repeatability, the accuracy, everything just rock solid. The stencil also gave me the locations to center punch and drill the mounting holes that go along the chassis. So every little thing that I did allowed me to be more accurate on this project. And again, I did it one time. I didn't have to fiddle with it. All of those steps that I discussed making both of these sliders from start to finish was less than an hour with design time, template cutting, cutting the steel, bending it, drilling it, mounting it on here less than an hour. That kind of accuracy I would never would have been able to do without some much more involved steps. If you guys would like to see a video specifically on that whole process in depth, maybe a little bit slower and more technical, let me know, suggest some parts that you would like to see. And maybe I can knock that out in a future video. For this process, again, since I'm designing this whole thing in CAD, I had the ability to work the shape of this transmission tunnel and everything around every component of this vehicle, including the VFD transmission that sits in the middle. Now that VFD transmission from Vanquish, it does come with these little shifters that mount on top and they're just for looks, but I want to use them. They can be scale points. So I wanted to integrate that opening into the design. And since I was making this cover for this area, I also wanted to integrate the mounting points for the seats that will go in the interior. So I extended the bases of those areas to give me an area to mount the seats. And I've 3D printed the seats already and attached them just with some 
double-sided tape right now so that I could see how everything was going to fit. In the first go around, I had the 3D printed part and then I put it on a piece of just quarter inch acrylic, made the you know draft angles with some clay, just formed it by hand. And that was pretty much it. I drilled some holes to make sure that air could get in and around this to try and allow it to draw down easier. I had one hole in the bottom of the center and then I had a hole so air could get through in that little shift area. But what happened is when the vacuum form material went down onto the PLA, it heated up the PLA, started to make it soft. And then the vacuum pressure that was being drawn in from the center went down with it. So I ended up with an interior mold that had this you know, weird dip in the center just didn't quite look right. So I knew that I could improve that and make it better. So I redesigned the part slightly. The finished dimensions of the actual Lexan part really didn't change, but I added the draft angles into actual you know, 3D printed material. I also did it in the front. I made the vent hole in the center, just right in the 3D milling. And I carried that all the way down into the center. But as you can see here on the back, I actually backfilled this entire part with some plaster of Paris. This is just a very simple powder that you mix with water. It self levels pretty quickly. You poured it in and now I've got a densely backfilled 3D printed mold. This is still just PLA. Uh, and if I was doing you know thicker or material that needed more heat to vacuum form, then I possibly would have needed to worry. But the formed part of this came out excellent. The only area that I had any issue was some of these draft angles where the 3D print was thicker. The heat did start to warp that a little bit, but it actually wasn't uh, a negative effect on the finished part. That's actually the last time I need it. So this, this is an actually disposable mold. I could make many more parts, but I don't need to. It's just a one-off for me. This vacuum former came from Old Time RC. They've got two sizes, A4 and A3. A4 is like a standard sheet of paper where the A3 size is the one that I have. It's more like 11 by 17. To vacuum form this material, we set the temperature on the machine at 230 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the heating elements were fully up to temperature, the material in place moved up. It took about 45 seconds for the material to sag down the 25 to 30 millimeters that's needed. And then you hit the vacuum and slam the plastic down onto your buck and out comes a functional vacuum formed part. But the benefit of it is now I have an extremely lightweight and accurate interior cover. It's, there's nothing to it. I trimmed out the sheet with some standard Lexan scissors and we have a perfectly molded interior. This is actually PETG, so it's a little bit easier to vacuum form than actual polycarbonate. This cover is made from 0.75 millimeter thick material, enough to be decently rigid, but doesn't add a lot of weight. Very simple. What I'm referring to when I say the structure is the inside structure that I've designed to support the individual body panels that I envisioned this truck to be fabricated from. My idea for this truck was to have separate fenders, separate hood, separate cowl, separate grill, the full side flat pieces as one part, and then multiple piece rear section. Now I knew to do that, I needed to have other parts inside that it would be bolted to so that I could, for one, exchange parts in and out. And for two, I didn't have to rely on the fastening of the parts to each other to then mount it to the chassis. This was what I envisioned to be the simplest way to do that. I assume that my opinion of what simple means is not widely accepted by most, however. But what we have currently installed here is my first version of this design. Now the design that I had in mind was going to be fabricated from 1.5 millimeter thick carbon fiber that I was going to machine here at home on my CNC router from Stepcraft. But what we currently have installed instead is some 1 16th inch thick acrylic. The reason that we have this here is because I was actually able to laser cut this. I have a friend who owns a car audio shop called Gately Audio and Bobby's a friend of mine and I called him up this weekend. And I said, hey, Bobby, you got any 1.5 millimeter thick material? And he had this acrylic that is very close to that same. And I said, I'm going to come 
laser some of that on your machine with your material so that I can see if this works before I cut up some expensive carbon fiber. I zipped over to Bobby's shop and jumped on his Laguna laser. Even though the acrylic is much cheaper than the carbon fiber that I had planned on using, the first thing that I made it out of was some cardboard material that he keeps at the shop for similar reasons. And I cut it out of that just to make sure that everything was, you know, looking like it was going to fit reasonably okay. You know, I had this locking design that this piece here represents the flat plate that goes up underneath of the hood and then the small side pieces attached to the side of the frame rails and key into this hood structure. And after quickly assembling this by hand in his shop, I was like, that's gonna work and we loaded up the acrylic. The acrylic cut well and actually feels really rigid in the truck. And as far as the execution of construction, it went as well as it could have. However, I think there's some deficiencies in my design, both aesthetically and just with how things function with this thickness. If this material was going to be thicker, like three millimeters, then I think that this design would have worked. Specifically what I'm referring to is the design of a lock nut being retained in a groove in the material so that you can bolt it all together. I'm going to abandon that style and I'm going to go to a design that uses some 3D printed components in corners and that it'll all screw into those and it'll hold things tight together, but it'll allow it to construct a little easier. The other positive of doing this prototype is that I actually really like the acrylic for this, you know, this task. And I think that I may stay with acrylic for this understructure, at least for now. If in the end, everything is just going so well and I'm absolutely in love with everything that I've done, maybe I'll cut carbon fiber because all of this should bolt and unbolt and be removable, replaceable, rebuildable easily in theory. But the first thing that I need to do is revise my design work to be optimized for this material thickness specifically, as well as the capabilities of a laser. Lasers can make perfectly sharp corners where CNC machining leaves radii based on the diameter of the tool. By the next time you see this truck, I think you're going to be seeing the picture of basically what this thing is going to look like when it's done, minus the final materials. But Everything went so well that I think that this is going to progress really quickly. And I'm optimistic at this point about where it's putting me in my timeline, but I'm not gonna count my chickens before they hatch. Now, as far as body panels that you see on here, currently you see these front fenders, you see the cowl and the side panels. Now you will likely notice that there's a ton of body gap happening right here. That's because this isn't actually attached and I don't have any tie-in designed in at this point to allow all of these things to be connected to a similar, you know, or like panel to just help control all of the you know, tolerances that are going on. That's going to be a very important part of what I need to do before we can really move forward. This fender bolts on with three screws currently from the top. They thread down into the fender itself and honestly, it, it feels really good. I do want an attachment point down here towards the bottom corner of the fender and any exposed hardware that will be on the body, especially in this area, I'm going to make of a smaller size, likely M2.5 and most certainly countersunk so that it's nice and flush, but a much smaller screw head so that it's not as visually distracting. These all acrylic side panels will be replaced with carbon fiber as that is the material that I want to be outwardly visible. Now I also lasered the grill of this. I don't have it attached currently because I haven't worked in those details yet. But when I designed this grill, I made it so that there was an exterior bolt pattern on there that allowed me to drop in a Vanquish Q series headlight, making things super simple to get insanely bright lights that also look really good. This needs to get dropped into the front here and it is going to require me to cut this extra bracing off as well as I'm going to cut this frame rail shorter. I do need to get bumpers fabricated. We'll go over the rules of a lot of those things as we go, but we're gonna pay very close attention to the rules, making sure that we meet them to the fuzzy letter of the law. 
Normally I would build a roll cage for this truck out of steel, most likely DOM tubing as it's much lighter than solid steel because I'm trying to stay weight conscious with a number of things. I don't wanna to add too much tubing or too much weight specifically up high. But the topic of titanium had come up and I was, I've been wanting to experiment with titanium for years and now felt like the best time to just dive into that as well while I'm doing other things that I don't know how to do very well. I was recently sent some titanium and I went to the YouTube school of titanium welding to really try and hone my virtual skills. Now, one of the most common ways to fabricate steel roll cages is to braze, which is using a torch typically, and then flowing the joint with a silver solder commonly. I know that's confusing with the terminology, but that's the simplest way to get it done. You Very basic tools. You can get basically a map gas torch from Home Depot and a little roll of silver solder, and that's really all you need. Another common way that I do is using a TIG welder, and then I use a filler material called silicon bronze. Now this is technically TIG brazing because silicon bronze melts at around 1700 degrees, whereas steel melts at closer to 2300 degrees. So you're getting it hotter than that threshold to be considered brazing, but not hot enough to melt the actual base materials of steel. So that's why it's still considered brazing, even though you're using a TIG welder. I'm very sorry for the very confusing terminology in this video. Now, silicon bronze is kind of a miracle material in a lot of ways, as you can use it to braze together mixed metals, you know, stainless steel to regular steel, uh, or, you know, all kinds of different things, steel to cast iron. It's been used a lot. Now, it's not as strong as regular welding, but it does wonders. I did some research to try and see if you could TIG braze this titanium. And I had seen some videos of people doing it, but we all know that that doesn't necessarily make it right. So I wanted to give it a shot myself. To run this test, I'm using my Razor Weld 160P TIG welder with straight argon as a shielding gas. The tricky part about titanium is that it oxidizes at a fairly low temperature. I believe it's in the 700 degree range. So it's super important to get a nice flow of gas around the area you're welding in so that you don't make the actual weld extremely dirty and porous from the oxidation that would happen. To do this properly, you can weld in a chamber that is completely purged of all air except something like argon, or you can use a number of other methods to try and keep the gas as focused around the part that you're welding as possible. For what I'm doing currently for this test, it's my very standard TIG welding process, except I am increasing the length of time that the gas starts flowing before my weld starts, and then greatly increasing the amount of time that the gas flows after my weld stops to allow it to cool down within that shielding gas. For the TIG brazing test, I took and I cleaned the titanium as best that I could. I scotch brighted it down with a scotch bright pad that had never touched another metal. Then I wiped it down with mineral spirits. I also cleaned my tungsten with mineral spirits and I sharpened it on something that had not sharpened steel or aluminum previously, trying to give myself the best chance of success. Using the silicon bronze filler rod, I used four seconds of pre-flow gas before my weld started. I got the joint area heated up and flowed in that silicon bronze bronze and then used 10 seconds of post-flow gas. For the next test, I took the titanium with a nice cope joint again so that everything fit together well, but this time without the silicon bronze. I wanted to actually just try to weld the two pieces of titanium together with fusion. I wasn't adding any additional filler material. I was just trying to get the two pieces of titanium hot enough so that they actually fused together. I used the same values for the pre and post flow gas and tried to weld this joint all together. For this joint, I did a very light amount of cleaning, basically a quick scuff and a wipe down with mineral spirits. I didn't spend a lot of extra time doing anything else. Then to give myself a bit of a baseline to measure against, I took two pieces of steel and used the silicon bronze to attach those together. I've done this a number of times and I know the strength of that joint is more than adequate. So I brought all of those samples in here to the workshop and and since they were all welded at 90 degrees, I was able to just get my hands on them and try and squeeze them to see if I could break the joint. The first one was the TIG brazed titanium pieces. 
while squeezing them, I could hear the cracking starting to happen. And after a decent amount of force, I was able to get that joint to break. Now it took a pretty good amount of force. I do think that these joints would be strong enough to hold up to exactly what I wanted to put it through, but it gives me just a little, I'm, I'm cautious because I was able to get them to break and I was able to just do it by hand. Now my just fuse welded with semi clean parts, I was not able to break. And this also wasn't even very well fused together. It basically had a strong tack on one side and then the other side, I had a decent enough weld. But again, I wasn't able to break it. And then testing my TIG brazed pieces of steel, was not able to break that by hand either. So in the end, I think that going the proper route of fully welding the two pieces of titanium is the best way to go. Now, the outcome of those tests is the important part. I really liked it. Doing a little bit of analysis, I wanted to see if there was any reason to even do it. So to compare it, I wanted to look at the weight. I wanted to compare solid titanium rod to solid steel rod, and finally, DOM steel tubing, so an actual tube with the appropriate wall thickness of the DOM tubing that I typically use, which is 0 0.035. And even by using solid titanium rod, I will still be about 5% lighter than I would with steel DOM tubing. So we're doing it, building a titanium cage. The one downside of that though, is that I need to be able to attach that cage to the rest of my chassis. Now I can't just use normal steel tabs like I would have normally or welded it directly to the chassis, which I may have done previously as well. That doesn't work. So I'm gonna have to have titanium tabs made. In order to further complicate the entire project, I'm going to design up all of the mounting points and tabs that I need, including the rear shock mounts, attachment to the chassis, you know, up front and in the back everywhere maybe even the windshield support, everything that I need. And I'm gonna send it out to be laser cut from titanium so that I can then weld that into the cage structure just to make sure that everything is perfect. I'm well aware of how ridiculous all of this sounds. Where do we go from here? We have a lot to get done left on this truck as well as my class two truck. Class one, we still need to finalize almost every part, the structure, the body panels, how the entire rear is going to assemble, the cage design, cage parts that I have to send out to be fabricated, bumpers, the rest of the scale points, which is a big part of a truck like this. And then I still have to do all of the functional, you know, electronics and making this thing work, let alone the tuning it to perform properly absolute mountain of work ahead on this truck. On my class two slash class three, we still have sliders, uh, mounting of the body. I need to build a cage to support this body. Possibly still thinking about doing an axle swap to the F10 axles like are underneath of my class one. Um, it needs an interior. It needs new bumpers that are tucked in a little bit more. And then for the class three conversion, we need to decide on what axle I'm going to use in the rear. Specifically, if I go to the F10 portals, I need to have a portal steering axle in the rear. Clearances for possibly bigger tires. Do I change the wheelbase when it all gets swapped? How far do I go? Exactly what has to get done? This truck runs and drives at this point already. So that's important. Definitely, I, I know that if I needed to, in a pinch, this thing could be ready in a night or two and basically be a competitive class two with the scale points that I would need. I could get that banged out. I know that this is the time suck of all time sucks. So in two weeks, when my next episode comes out, expect to see massive progress. Of all of the things that we listed that I have to get done on both, make sure and comment below what actual items you would like me to see more in-depth information on what would you like me to just really explain well or you know show you the process behind it so that you can either learn with me as i possibly screw up or maybe i succeed 
My episode will not be for two weeks, so make sure and go check out Matt's episode next week. Again, we are going to do every other week, but we're going to stagger them. So every week you'll have an episode of this series to watch. It'll just be either from me or from Matt at Scale Builders Guild. Make sure and comment below, hit the like button if you enjoyed this video and the new fabrication heavy style that I'm planning to put into a lot of my videos because it's what I enjoy so, so much. Make sure and subscribe. And as always, thanks for watching. We'll see you on the next one.